I, I want to share with you a few stories from the Old Testament about dads. And to, to get us there, tell me about your dad. Was he there? Was he not? Did you know him? Did you know him and you wish you would have never known him? Was he a standard, an example of what a man is and should be? Or did he go the other way? Was he an alcoholic, a drug addict? Did he leave you and your mom for another woman? And now does he have two families and God knows what else? What, whatever it is, when we talk about dads, whether it's good or bad, it moves our heart. There is emotion there. And the eyes missed a little bit, whether it's good or bad. I was meditating this morning on my father, who's been gone for 40 years. And just the things he taught me and the things that uh, I learned from him. I thought he was perfect until I was 25. And uh, just had a wonderful, wonderful relationship with him. He was a good teacher. But not everybody can say that. And sometimes it brings pain to think about who your father was or is or did or didn't do. And uh, I don't have a fire and brimstone sermon today, but I just want us to reflect on this Father's Day. First of all, that thank God that we have our Father, which is in heaven, and his name is indeed hallowed or blessed. And uh, Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus Christ is our Father and God is our Father. So, well, if you know, which, well, Jesus is God. We don't have a grandfather and then a father in Jesus. He is our father, our heavenly father, our Abba father. And I, I, just want to, I just want us to think a little bit and reflect. I want to talk about David and other fathers. David and other fathers. And we're going to talk about David's father first. David is a 10th generation from Ruth the Moabites. She was the woman that left Moab and followed Naomi into Israel. And then 10 generations down, um, he is born, David. His, his father's name is Jesse. We know a little bit about him. We know that he was very old. We know that he had other sons, eight of them. And just in, in this incident or in this event of Samuel going to Bethlehem to anoint another king. Saul was the first king and he was rejected by God because of two very simple things. You don't have to sin a lot to be in trouble with God. It doesn't have to be a big sin. In fact, if we make a list of David's sins, adultery, murder, drunkenness, covering up, homicide, all of those things, long list of sins that David committed, and you, you put those against two sins that Saul committed, which is that he did not kill everyone at Amalek. He saved the king and a few choice cattle. And then one day in another time, the service was about to start and Samuel, the, the pastor, the priest, the prophet didn't arrive. So Saul began the service. He started the sacrifice and God rejected him for those two things. And so God tells Samuel, fill up your horn. I want you to go down to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse, and you are going to anoint one of his sons to be the next king of Israel. And so um, people were afraid when the prophet came into town. It was a scary thing. When Samuel walks into town, first of all, Samuel told God, you know, if I go there and say I'm going to anoint a king, Saul's going to kill me. And God said, just go and tell him you're going to do a sacrifice. You're going you're to make a feast and you're going to have dinner with Jesse's family. So when Saul walks in, everybody starts greeting. Rather, when Samuel walks in, everybody starts greeting him. And he, uh, uh, they say, do you come in peace? Do you come in peace? You know, are, are we okay? Are you, are you bringing a bad word uh, over us? And he says, no, I come in peace. So he says, I come to the house of Samuel, to, of Jesse, and I'm going to anoint one of his eight sons. One of them. God didn't tell him which son it was going to be. And so there is a whole um, ceremonial aspect of this visit where Samuel informs Saul, um, Jesse, one of your sons is going to be the king. So he brings out the oldest one. Eliab, and then Abinadab, and then Shammah, and, and then the, the rest. And none of them uh, moved 
Samuel's heart. And, and Samuel was looking at him and God said, you don't look at the, in, at the outside. You look at the inside. That's what I'm looking for. And none of them moved Samuel's heart. And we pick up the story right there in 1 Samuel 16, 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? In other words, are you out of sons? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. The new um, international version says, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. There's a but here in Jesse's answer. Can you imagine the boys are strutting across Strong shoulders, lift up your head. And Samuel there with his horn, taking notes. Is this the one, Lord? No, 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 no. Seven times. And then Samuel says, are we out of boys here? Are all the young men here? And um, then he says, no, yeah, it's, it's David. But he's keeping the sheep. He's, he, he's young. He's, the, this is your crop right here. And he says, no, we will not eat until we bring him. And so what is David doing out there? He's keeping the sheep. Uh, I got to throw some jabs, okay? Thank you, four of you. All right. I want to know why David was the only one working in the middle of the day. I want to know if Jesse and his other sons were playing on the iPad, were playing games. Do you know that one of the biggest problems today is fathers that are addicted to games, the internet, and their iPads and phones, and their sons don't know the Bible? All right, you don't have to worship the Lord. You're still getting a barbecue after, after church, all right? What were they doing there? Listen, it is important that we teach our sons to work. The Bible says that first is the natural and then the spiritual. And before we can go into the spiritual realm, we have to understand the natural realm. A lot of kids all over the world, young men come up to me. How can I be a pastor? How can I preach? Teach me how to preach. And when we have time, I said, okay, you want me to give you some classes on preaching? Yes. And they take out their, their, their pads and say, what, what do I do? Go clean your room. Go wash your car. Pick up your clothes. Take out the trash. If you work, help at the house. Give some money for the bills. You still want to preach? You see, everybody wants to get into the spiritual without first organizing the natural. In this household, it seems that the only one that had these things in order was David. Where's, where's the, oh, he's out there, but he's working. I have had many conversations with young men. If you ever hear a young man preach this, you listen to what I say, not to, not to what they say, because I know more. Okay, uh, it's just my age and my good looks. All right, that's just all, all it is. They t I've heard this. I haven't worked a day in my life. I've lived by faith. What do you think about that? And I say, no tienes vergüenza. Because when you don't learn how to work, when you don't have to be any place at 8 o'clock, and I know these guys, they travel around preaching all over, they sleep till 11, play golf till 4, and then they're ready for the next revival. They need to get to work. They need to get up early. They need somebody, they need to learn that somebody's going to scream at them if they don't do things right. They do not learn the ethics of work. Brothers and fathers, you need to teach your children. Do you know that the Smiths, you know, there's no Smiths here this morning. They didn't come to this Mexican church. All right, there's no Smiths here. But a Smith was somebody that used to work iron. And they were a Smith to put the horseshoes on and things like that. And then they would teach their son the trade. And they would teach. And so that's not really the name of the first one. But yeah, let's go over to the Smith, to the Smith, to the Smith. Over the generations, they're Smiths. And they learned the trade. You need to teach your son the trade. Teach him how to work. Teach him how to do things. Teach him how to be faithful in the natural. Because it will be when he is faithful in the natural, then he'll get his opportunities in the spiritual. You don't kill giants before you kill a bear and a lion and at least a rabbit. Young men want to go out there and kill giants and they've never done anything else. So David is out there and it, it, when you're faithful in the natural, you will have revelation in the spiritual. 
I'd, I'd like for you to open your Bible to the, to the Psalms of Sama. Oh, he didn't write one. Open your book to the Psalms of Eliab or Abinadab, the other sons of David. There's no Psalms. We know them because they're the Psalms of David. Why? Because only David could write what he learned in the natural. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie in green pastures. He, he gives me to drink through the water brooks. He restores my soul. Why could David write that? Because what he's basically saying is, just like I care for the sheep, just like I tend the sheep, so the Lord is my shepherd. But if he didn't have that experience, he would have never wrote the psalm. So dads, we got to teach our boys to work. And, and I don't know if Jesse knew what was going on here his father, but, but they bring him over. You know, the story, so God tells Samuel, this is the one he anoints him. And back then they would pour the horn of oil over his whole head. It's dripping down. And David's just a little, you know, I don't know what 16 year old boy. We don't know. He's a lad and he is now anointed King. First Samuel 17, as the story goes, um, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem of Judah, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, and the third is Shammah. David was the youngest. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back the news. Let me ask you some questions. When Jesse sent David, did he believe David would limit himself to being a DoorDash worker for that day? Did Jesse know that he was exposing his young and tender son to how men die in battle? Did he even imagine how David, in his adolescent curiosity, would be inquiring for his brothers, always with a possibility that they were dead or injured? Did Jesse even consider that David could be hurt or killed by a stray arrow? What if the Philistines would have charged the camp at that moment? The truth is that Jesse sends his son without having the slightest idea that he would meet the giant. The giant. And that just as he returned home a hero, he could have returned home in a body bag. It's interesting to note that Jesse did one thing good with David. I don't know about the rest of the sons, but he taught him responsibility. The scriptures are not out here, but if you read this story, the Bible says that when David went to take the lunch, he left the sheep with another person to care for them. He did not abandon the sheep and say, well, you know, I can't be in both places at one time. Either I keep the sheep or I take the lunch, you know? No, he left. And then he had a cart with him when he went and he left the cart with a valet, if you would. In other words, David is responsible everywhere you look at him. No wonder God gave him the Messiah as a son. No wonder we, we sing the Psalms of David. We have the city of David. We have the star of David. And it did not start up here in heaven. It started in the natural. Dads, we need, you need to sit down and teach your sons how to change the oil, how to change a flat tire, how to fix something around the house or to be smart and make money to pay for somebody to do it. Our sons are like sheep without a shepherd right now. Talking generally, speaking generally. Jesse did a good job. And fathers, we're always sending our children to war, whether we like it or not. Many times, especially adolescents, are at war, whether fathers know or don't know or want to know about it. And these battles have various fronts. First of all, they have a physical front. As the a, as a young man's organism undergoes phases, awakening sexual instincts, seeking affirmation and strengthening of their personality. They face temptations. They face their school environment. Friends who induce them to do evil and many times degenerate into the use of alcohol, drugs, and various perversions. Your boys are fighting whether you know it or not. 
They're fighting battles. But where do they go if their father is addicted to Netflix? If their father's too tired? Or if his, their father has not won his own battles? Let me tell you something. Your sons are going to fight your demons. Every man knows his demon. I know your demons too. Because there's only three of them. And, and, and your son... It depends on whether you have the victory over your demon or not. Your son is going to fight the same demon. And uh, we need, you need to talk to them about sex. Don't let, it learn, don't let them learn it from the, from the internet, from their friends. Their friends don't know anything. And, and these kids at 8, 9, 10, they, they know a lot of stuff. They talk a lot. They see a lot of stuff. Dads, wake up. Happy Father's Day. You need to sit down with him at 9, 10, 11 years old and say, Mijo, do you like girls? No. Then you go to the prayer room. You know, sometimes boys come up to me here in church. They're, they're already 20s or something. Pastor, pray for us. Pray for me. Some, I don't know why they always come in twos. What's wrong with you guys? They're embarrassed to come by and say, Pastor, we, we got a problem. What's your problem? We, we like women. I said, raise your hands. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, 25 years ago, it would be this right now. Thank you, Jesus. And you talk to them. Of course, you're going to feel things. When you see a chair, you're not going to feel it when you see a pretty girl. Of course, your body is going to react. You're a man. Praise God. Now let's deal with that. But I'm not your boy's father. You are. Long time ago, 15-year-old boy here in this church committed fornication. That means having sex when you're not married, just in case. Committed fornication with another 15-year-old girl. So the family is a whole problem. And uh, so the, the dad brings the boy in. He goes, I want you to help my son. He says, you know, he's, now he's... He's a man, but he's not a man, and he did this, and he was baptized, and with the whole thing. And he said, I want you to help. I said, no, I'm not going to help your son. You're not going to help my son? No. You're not going to help us? I didn't say that. I'm not going to help your son. I'll help you, but I'm not going to help your son. He said, what do you mean? He said, can't I bring him to you? I said, no, you come. Let me help you teach your son. Three weeks later, he came. He said, Pastor, something has been happening. Everything you tell me, I go tell him, but we're getting this relationship now. He's beginning to trust me. I'm, he's beginning to open up. That's exactly. Dads, we got to wake up. I don't know how, how, how loud to, to scream this. Sometimes the, the battle, the battle is, 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 rages in the home itself. Fighting against many factors. Look at what your kids are fighting. They're fighting your own indifference. The poor testimony of their parents. The lack of elevated ideals. Sometimes the daily battle of fighting for the basic things of life results in constant defeat. Translation, why are we always poor? If you're always poor, you've got to ask yourself some questions. The saddest thing is that at times in the child's home, either for the lack of resources or the lack of inspiration or for the lack of spiritual ideals or the lack of better perspectives, the home itself opposes the child's intellectual and spiritual cultivation and development. Add to that the family and parental conflicts, favoritism, lack of care. All these things are enemies of our children. Sometimes the brightest and strongest overcome. Others don't and are destined to live a subpar life. Sometimes the battle is spiritual and in the very church. The church should see in every child and every youth a warrior. Not because of their experience, but because of their potential. David was young, he had some experience, but never had he killed a giant. And I want you to notice this. When Jesse told him, get up early and go quickly, read the story. Get up early and go quickly. Had David not gotten up early and gone quickly, he would have missed the giant. God had everything timed perfectly when, this day, when he saw that David was responsible in the natural, when he saw that, that, that David knew how to take care of sheep or leave the sheep or communicate, 
You know, if you're not going to go someplace, you're not expected to be able to be everywhere, but you communicate. David was one of those guys. So David, the, uh, God times it perfect. Here comes David. He's got the lunch. He's got the lunch. And out comes Goliath at the right time. Being responsible in the natural will give you opportunities in the spiritual. Don't expect spiritual opportunity. Don't expect great things if you don't take care of the small things in life. And so we've got to look at our boys. Yeah, they're maybe, you know, away from God. They have no notion of God, but that's your fault. That's my fault. That's not their fault. But we need to see in every one of them a, a, a potential. We can't have that Jesse attitude. Yes, but, yes, but he's out there working. It, it, was, a, it was an oxymoron what he was saying. Yeah, it, it's like he's saying, yeah, he's not important, but yet he's the one that's working and that's, respons that's responsible. We never know what God can do in the life of one child. Who would have thought that the child who carried Jesse's food basket of dried grain and loaved breads would give God's people the victory that day? And when he stood before Saul, Saul said, who are you? It's interesting because a chapter before, he used to play the harp for Saul. But that's something for theologians to figure out. We're not going to figure out that this morning. But he says, "How you're not a man of war. You, you, you can't, you've never fought out there. You're a young lad. Oh, that's true, Saul. But one day a lion came, one day a bear came. I slew them, boy, and, and God will give me this one too. And he saw so much in him that he sent him out to fight. And David had the victory. Hallelujah. So your son right now may be a lazy on the couch doesn't want to study, doesn't want to work, do nothing. Do me a favor, do him a favor, do you a favor. Flip the filter for a little bit. And instead of looking at a lazy, no good, doesn't want, look, look at the potential. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. There's something in that boy. There's something in that girl that if you tap into that potential, you just saw my son here. I would, I, I would beg him. Why don't you go into the ministry? No, he went all the way to the interviews. He sat in the meetings. He sat through the interviews and then he would call me, Dad, that's not for me. I, no, no, no. And I found out later why. His name is Sam Valverde with a junior. Imagine that. He said, Dad, I go to the church with my friend on a Sunday. I'm just going to go visit. This is before he was married. And, and the pastor says, hi, there. what's your name? I'm Sam Valverde. Say, then you're going to preach. No, I don't do that. But your name's San Valverde. He says, I lived under that cloud. So I don't want to preach. I, I, I don't want to. And, and Rachel and I just kept praying. And I, I, she, he has something. Let me tell you something. Sam is probably going to be a better pastor than me. Sam has this spirit, this calmness. He's got this tranquility. He's got this discernment about him. He, he's just a thinker. And, and, and I believe that our church in Phoenix is going to grow into the hundreds and hundreds because he has potential. And for a while there, I lost sight of it. For a while there, I would get angry and frustrated and that worsened the relationship. Dads, somebody has to be an adult. If your son isn't 25 years old yet, his brain hasn't developed to the fullest. You have at least, a, at least I think, a developed brain. Let's talk about another father. And I've preached on this before, so I'm just going to glaze through. Kish. Who's Kish? Kish is Saul's father. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechareth, and the son of Apia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And notice here how the register says the son of, the son of, the son of. That's very important because we are all the sons of. Miguel. Refugio. Uh, Francisco. That's as far as I can go back, Joe. You can go Mario Erasmo. And uh, Refugio and Francisco, our grand, my grandfather, your great-grandfather, his name was Francisco. I don't know what happened beyond that. We're the son of, we're the son of. And what you and I are as dads, it means a lot. The son of, the son of, the son of. 
But watch what this great and mighty man of power does. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. Look at those words, choice and handsome. There was not a more handsome person among he, among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And now the problem. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of your servants with you and arise and go look for the donkeys. And you may be one like this, that your dad only sent you after the mundane at best and the dumb stuff at worst. Your life might be one that maybe, maybe you were just sent off for the donkeys. You were the, you were the blue collar. You were the, you were the tonto. Like one brother said, I have a lot of kids. They all eat. He says, some are smart and some are dumb, but they all eat a lot. <laughs> and your life might be one where your dad didn't believe in you. Look at Saul's potential. Man, send him to the Lakers for crying out loud. He's taller than everybody, head and shoulders. Again, the potential. Where is your son taller than anybody else? Where is your son choicier? He said, well, I, I don't find it. Well, your job today, starting today, is to look for it. Pray for it. Expose to me, God. Reveal to me. What's my son good? And then back him up and praise him. And help him and pay for it. Did Kish have any idea that while he sent his son chasing after dumb things or at best mundane things, that he would come back anointed as the first king of Israel? Did he imagine that on that trip, Saul would meet, listen to this, Saul would meet and dine like a prince with Samuel the prophet and 30 other princesses? Samuel having saved the best portion for Saul. It seems that Kish did not see Samuel's potential. His height serving as imagery of the heights that God would take him. We need to see the potential in every one of our children and guide them, motivate them, serve as examples of what we happen when we believe in God and his promises. Man, in the Spanish service, I'm going to go nuts here because here's the calls we get. Ay, pues que le llamaron de una universidad, pero yo no sé, no entiendo inglés. That's the extent of backing up their children who are winning over scholarships and, and knocking on the doors of the best universities. And one father told me, I don't have money for a laptop. But his truck has all kinds of tires and little things he buys in Tijuana and little bobbing heads and all that stuff. <laughs> Come on, don't make me angry this morning. Come on, Martin, it's Father's Day. Let's talk about David, Absalom's father. Because David had sons and David was a good king. And he did kill Goliath and he did write the Psalms. But he was a horrible father. Four of his sons were killed by God as a punishment for what he did with Bathsheba. Look at David as a father. Let's look at the other side. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him return to his own house. The king, the king is David. Absalom hasn't seen David. Absalom was another beautiful specimen. The Bible says that there was no one better looking than him in all of Israel. That from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, there was not one blemish in Absalom. Imagine that. He let his hair grow long and cut it once a year. Don't do that, guys. Because now we have the letter of 2 Corinthians. Just say, you know, I'm a pastor. I have to jab, 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 jab. Hey, Joab, Joab was his... General says, I got Absalom with you. You've been, you've been talking about him. And David says, let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, but he did not see the king's face. You know what I find in this verse? I find that men with muscles and six feet tall and that can run things and do jobs and manage factories and build things and all that stuff are afraid of confrontation and intimacy with their own son. Take him. I don't want him to see my face. And the more you don't allow yourself to talk the important things with your son, 
the more I am afraid of intimacy to sit down to either correct gently and wisely or to speak or to intimacy. We use that word in marriage counseling, but if you say it real slow, what is it? Into me see. And if you are afraid to let your son into you see, into me see, David was good with the ladies. He was good with the rocks. He was good with the slings. He was good with the, with the soldiers. He was good with everybody else. But he did not sit down and talk to his son. My favorite memories of my dad were when he opened up and opened me up one-on-one. -on -one. And I believe that by the grace of God first, and because of that, I'm here today. 65 years old. In one convention, pre-Rachel, I was talking outside to a girl. This happened in, in Oakland, in Oakland, California, near where you live. And I, I was outside, I was talking to this, to this sister. I was doing convention evangelism. <laughs> but I could see inside, and the service was going on. And then I saw him walking down the aisle, coming my way. I tried to cut off the conversation, but she just wouldn't stop. You know, I, I know what she was thinking. When you get some good, you don't let it go. That's what she was thinking. <laughs> Here's my dad. I'm over here talking. Okay, okay. This is the girl. She looked like that too. No. <laughs> and I'm right here and I see him coming. He stops right here. And he goes, Semi, sígame. That means, Sam, follow me. It's like Jesus with Levi. Follow me. And I said, I got to go. And I followed him. And I followed him. Everybody in the convention knew that he had gone out and got me in. I'm walking the walk of shame down that aisle. I go, Dad, can we sit back here? No. We sat in the front. And then the preaching started. And I, kind of, I was kind of embarrassed. But then I got into the preaching and God blessed me that day so much in the altar that if my dad hadn't pulled me out, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was talking. I shouldn't talk during church. And then on the way home, he talked to me from Oakland to Gilroy. What is it, two hours? He talked to me. Nothing wrong with liking girls, with talking girls. Well, you don't do it during service. Look how God blessed you. And he opened himself. I was a young man too. I know what it feels like. And he opened himself. David did not do that. I don't want him to come to my house. And when he, the Bible says, Now in all of Israel there was no one who, who was praised as much as Absalom except his father for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head there was no blemish. And when he cut his, the head of his hair at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. When he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head. 200 shekels according to the king's standard. To Absalom were born three sons, a daughter named Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. I'm not talking about that he comes in for dinner and picks up a burrito and, hey, dad, and we'll see you next week. No, no. I'm talking about sit down, intimate teaching moments or minutes or hours or days. Dads, let's wake up. If you don't teach your sons, somebody else is going to teach them. And they're not going to teach them with the word and with the Proverbs. Therefore, Absalom sent for Joab. Look at, look at his, look at how hungry he is to talk to his dad. Some of your boys are hungry. They, 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 they'll fake that. They're, all right. How are you? You know, and here's, here's the talk of a dad. Hey, how you doing? Hey, what's up? What's up? Cool. I'm, I, okay. Wow. How deep. Man, God moved. Heavens were opened. No. Joab's dying. Absalom sent for Joab. If I can't see my dad, can I talk to his general? Who's close to my dad that I can talk to? He won't let me see him, but I, I'm dying here. And is that the cry that we're hearing from adolescents and our young men today? You want your son to have two girls pregnant before he's 20 and, and then in jail and then in juvie and then in drugs and then... 
experimenting with bisexualism and transgenderism and homosexualism and all that stuff. Is that what you want, Dad? What's going to wake us up? I'm not, I'm not being mean. I'll tell you what I'm going to be mean. It's not today. But it's really frustrating to see parents with just folded arms, just in work, got to work, got to work, got to work. I told my son not too long ago, I said, look, if you don't spend time right now with your son, you're going to be sitting outside of the courtrooms. You're going to be looking. You can't afford to right now. You know how much a lawyer costs? You know how much a problem can cost you? You know how much time? I've been with parents to courthouses, to jury trials, to, to, to depositions and everything. And it's just, and, and, and son, son, but it's too late. You didn't, you didn't let, you didn't sit down with Absalom. So, so now Absalom has to do it. He sends for Joab. Look at, look at the, I'm almost done here really. In, in, in five minutes, come to the piano and then they think I'm done. Therefore, Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. Not even Joab. Did David tell him, don't pay attention to Absalom? I don't want to talk to him. I don't know. And when he sent the second time, he would not come. Do you see Absalom's desperation? I want to see my dad. I need my dad. Don't tell me you don't need your dad, son. Don't tell me. I'm 65 years old. And I hide my tears, but there are times that I still need my dad. I need somebody to hug me without prejudice. Oh, está bien. He's all right. No quiere. You're not making the effort, perhaps. He sent for him the second time, but he would not come. So he said to his servants, look at what Absalom does. See, Job's field is near mine, and he has barley there. Go set it on fire. Is that what's going to make you come to your son and to your senses when things are burning? Is that, is that what's going to wake us up? Passive fathers create monsters. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom's house and said, Why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, Look, I sent to you saying, Come here, so that I may send you to the king to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me that, to be there still. Why did you send for me if you don't want to see me? Now therefore let me see the king's face. But if there is iniquity in me, let him execute me, kill me, do what you got to do. But I want to see my dad. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but I know that many times what a man, for a young man, a young woman will do to get your attention, dad. It's, it's not that addiction or that event or that incident. Sometimes boys are just trying to get your attention. But you will not give it to them. So Joab went to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. Then the king kissed Absalom. Man, that's a lot of work for a kiss. That's a whole lot of work. Who stole my hanky? Somebody did. That's a lot of work for one kiss. Burning fields, begging generals, waiting two years. How long has it been that your son doesn't see your real face? Well, David paid the price, and the next two scriptures I'm going to read are super moving. Absalom gets killed. The very hair that he let grow got caught on an oak tree. The meal went running and he stayed hanging. And Joab killed him. David had told Joab, when you go out to battle, because Absalom rebelled against his father. Absalom got 50 chariots to fight against his own father. See, if you don't fight 
for your son, your son will fight against you and all your values. I've talked to men now, sons of pastors and bishops who want nothing to do with the church. They'll fight against everything their father ever stood for because the church robbed their dad. And now they hate God and they hate the church and they hate anything to do. And I don't want any. They've told me, you're nice, Brother Sam. You're, you're nice, but I don't want anything. I don't want anything. And so when they were going out to battle, David tells her, um, be kind to Absalom. I know he's our enemy, but be kind. But he wasn't. Joab killed him. And the news comes to David. Put your seatbelts on for this scripture. Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son. And David's thinking those two years he was here just a block away. He was a block away. My son Absalom. If only I had died in your place. And Ab oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Can you feel his pain? Now, Rachel, you've heard me preach this a lot of times. But you, what you haven't heard is what it says in the next chapter. And Joab was told, behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it. Said that day the king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king, look at this verse, the king covered his face. I don't care. But David, we won the battle. I don't care. We, we won the battle, but I lost my son. And I didn't lose him on the tree. I lost him two years ago when he wanted to talk to me. I got my business. I got my home. I got my retirement. I got my edge. I got everything, but I lost my son. Tell me, is it worth it? I almost lost Sammy. I'm not standing up here saying, oh, look at me. Follow me. No. I almost lost that pastor in Phoenix. This close. And it wasn't him. I was too busy. But the king covered his face and the king cried out with a loud voice. Kings aren't supposed to express grief. Oh, my son, Absalom, he's screaming. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. 2 Samuel 18, 13 through 2 Samuel 19, 104. How many times do you see my son, my son, my son, my son? Are you going to wait till it's too late? What can we say about great pain and deep grief and unfathomable regret? Is there something we can do now in order to avoid cutoffs that end in death? Absalom killed his brother Amnon by getting him drunk at dinner. Where did Absalom learn how to get men drunk at dinner before having them killed? <sighs> Dads, are we watching our steps? If we aren't, be assured that they are watching them and very carefully. The last one. And in five minutes, did I say that? All preachings have one introduction and four conclusions. You know that. I want to talk about an unnamed dad. At just the last one here. I want to talk about Goliath's father. The Philistine army had a hero named Goliath. Who was from the town of Gath and was about three meters tall. That's nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, had a bronze armor to protect his chest, his legs. The chest armor alone weighed 57 kilograms. He carried a bronze sword strapped on his back. And his spear was so big that the iron spearhead alone weighed about 7 kilograms. A soldier always walked in front of Goliath to carry his shield. Goliath went out and shouted to the army of Israel. Why are you lining up for battle? I'm the best soldier in our army and all of you are in Saul's army. Choose your best soldier to come out and fight me. If he can kill me, our people will be your slaves. But if I kill him, your people will be our slaves. Here and now I challenge Israel, whole army, choose someone. Well, you know the story. 
David comes out and David says, today the Lord will help me defeat you. I'll knock you down and cut off your head and I'll feed the bodies of the other Philistine soldiers to the birds and wild animals. This is, this is a, what, a 14 year old talking to a man that's nine feet tall. Then the whole world will know that Israel has a God. Everyone here will see that God, that the Lord doesn't need swords or spears to save his people. The Lord always wins his battles and he will help us defeat you. When Goliath started forward, David ran towards him, put a rock in his sling, swung a sling around the straps. When he let it go of the strap, the rock flew and hit Goliath on the forehead. It cracked his skull and he fell face down on the ground. David defeated Goliath with a sling and rock. He killed him without even using a sword. Then he ran and pulled out his own Goliath's sword. He cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw what had happened to the hero, they started running away. But the soldiers of Israel and Judah let out a battle cry and went after them. As far as Gath and Ekron, the bodies of the Philistines were scattered all along the road from Sharim to Gath to Ekron. When the Israelite army returned from chasing the Philistines, they took what they wanted from the enemy camp. David took Goliath's head to Jerusalem, but he kept Goliath's weapons in his own tent. We've already discussed David's dad. Now let's talk about Goliath's dad. On one side of the valley, a hero is born. He's up on the shoulders of all the soldiers. And out come the pretty girls. Saul killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Yay, David! And David's got the, the, the head of the giant by his hair. Walking, they're walking him over to Saul. But I don't want to talk about heroes in this point. We all want heroes. We all want the gold. Don't talk to me about the silver and the bronze. Who won the gold medal? We, are, we always identify with the winners. I, we can't think that the fleeing Philistines had time to bury the body of which moments before had been their champion. It is most likely that the giant had saved the Philistines from many other onslaughts from other armies. What is left of Goliath, his torso and extremities quickly turned to carry on, to bird feed, decaying flesh being fought over by low flying buzzards. What had been a human body that prompted admiration from others dissipated into nothing in the flower of his life. We all like heroes, don't we? No one likes second or third place. We go for the gold, the winning team. We look for them. We seek them out as if their victory and glory will somehow rub off on us. We get some of the victor's glory and maybe even a benefit. David's dad did not have to pay taxes for the rest of his life because David had killed Goliath. But the story is not incomplete if we only talk about Goliath to exalt David's victory. On the other side of the valley, David is being carried on the shoulders of the soldiers. And by the time the news gets to his father, David is the newborn hero in Israel. The slaps on the back of Jesse's weakened back. The handshakes and congratulations. Wow, we didn't know about that, son. My, my, I thought he only played the harp. Or I thought he was just a shepherd boy, Jesse. Where have you been hiding him? The, the other soldiers watched him with admiration, mingled with a little bit of jealousy. The girl sang and the mothers eyed him carefully. That would make one good son-in-law. The laughter, the, did you see that rock fly? Did you see Goliath fall? A thousand recounts of the story just made Jesse beam with pride. But let's pan the camera on the other side of the valley. We can only imagine and question how Goliath's family took the news. Forget for a second that it was a battle between God's people and and, and the enemy, there's a family here. Did he indeed have a father? How and who broke the news to him? What effect did it have on him? How did he react when he found out his son was dead? And if he hurried, if he just hurried, he might still be able to find a body to bury. And that body was missing a head, they said. The list of interrogatives is endless. The truth is that not all of our children are heroes. They are not even perfect. Life is imperfect. The drug addict, the alcoholic, the pregnant teenager also has a dad. The man on death row, the murders, the thieves, the criminals, the prostitutes, and those that end up on the electric chair or the gas chambers. 
the marginalized from society and the rejected by all, people whose presence we tend to flee, not seek, those who are seen as a shame to society, children who just don't have it, they're not smart, they just can't, they're sick, they're mentally ill. They're all sons and daughters of someone. Goliath's father stared down at the rotting flesh of what had been his son. Did he weep? What was he thinking? You may have a son or daughter that never made it on the team, didn't graduate, whose life is a string of mishaps and mess ups. Maybe a little love from a father would make their day to day. And if that's you, if that one is you, I'd like to introduce you to our father, which is in heaven, whose love is real and deep, so deep that he came down as a man in the form of Jesus Christ to mediate between God and men. He loves you. He died on the cross for you. You do not have to be fatherless today. I'd like to pray for all the dads. Would you come to the altar? your dad with you here man I would give fifty thousand dollars to be able to hug my dad for an hour I really would I'd find him someplace Joe I don't know I don't have fifty thousand dollars I I would you would too one hour to touch him again say bless me dad bless me man if you have a son bless him Bless him. He's not perfect, but bless him. I'm not going to repeat this sermon. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to be strong. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. I write to you, fathers, because you are strong in the Lord and you have overcome the wicked one. Lord, I pray for all the sons that are out, gone, lost, away. Bring back the prodigals and help each father here investigate, analyze, take inventory. What did I, where did I miss up, God? How long did I not see Absalom's face? How many times did my son need me? Wanted to talk to me, but I was busy. Give me that grit, God, to correct them with love, with Bible, with, with meaning. They know when I'm talking from the heart. And I thank you for my dad, and I thank you for my sons.